This talk is something I've been, I've been, I don't know, I guess learning over a period of, I guess, 45 to 50 years or something, playing with, playing with fish. I haven't gotten it right yet, so I'm still experimenting with it. But uh, it's, been, it's been fun. Some of the things I think I've learned that I've learned from people who have helped me over the years, people in North Jersey, people in Brooklyn, people in Greater City, Nassau County, uh, Jer Jersey Shore. Um, over the years. Uh, it's good because you go to different clubs, you get, you get to meet different people, you get to learn different things, you get to exchange ideas, and from that we learn. We learn how to do things, we learn how to be better hobbyists. If you're into breeding, you probably learn how to start breeding fish a little bit better, you get more to survive, <laughs> which is always a good thing. Um, so this is, this is a little talk on that, things that I've learned over the years, different things that I've picked up on that I hope, uh, I hope you'll enjoy. Okay, three most important aquarium rules. Water changes, water changes, water changes. Rosario Lacour told me, he said, you don't need filters if you do water changes every day. Makes sense, you know? I mean, that's what it comes down to, water changes. So that's, that's, an, important, that's an important thing to know. It's very important to do your water changes. What, I've, what I found, what works for me, Everybody's a little bit different. But for what works for me is whatever you do, make a habit of it. So if you do 10% um, a week, continue to do 10% a week. If you do 25%, 50%, I know people who do 90%, depending on the type of species you have. Uh, and they could do it, you know, some people do it daily. Some people do it twice a week. Some people do it week. Some people do it monthly. Some people never do it. You know, it's whatever works for you. But the more water changes you do, the healthier your fish will be and the larger they will grow. It's just, it's just, these are just facts, okay? Best thing I found in the world for the hobbyist is the python. The python, prior to the python, I was keeping, I had like 37, 38 tanks in my basement. It would take me about 12 to 15 hours to do water changes via buckets. And I was young and I was strong and I didn't care because it's a labor of love, right? But as you get older, <laughs> things change. So this came out, I went from doing it for like greater than half a day to doing it in less than four hours. So really makes, and you could do more and it's not the work, it's not the lugging. You know, you don't have to worry about throwing your back out or hurting your feet or flooding the floors like I normally do. So that's like, to me, is the greatest invention in the world, the python. Um, other things we do water changes in, of course, depending on the size of your tanks, is buckets, different size buckets for different size fish tanks. Obviously, bigger buckets for bigger fish tanks. Okay, and if you're using like baby fish, little tiny fish, I use pipettes or turkey basters. You can also use them for feeding, you know, for feeding babies with baby brine shrimp or, or ro frozen rotifers or, or whatever you plan on using. Okay, it seems to help out a lot and keep the fish in a small, smaller environment. Obviously, you've got to do more water changes in a smaller environment, but it pays off. Okay, um, these are things that you would use to treat the water. And now they have like chloramine in the water as opposed to just uh, chlorine in the water. So there are other things that we got to, as hobbyists we have to concern ourselves about. Um, never do a water change after a, after a heavy rainstorm because the, uh, the water departments normally throw a lot of chlorine in the water because of that, because a lot of things start backing up. So in order to count, counteract that, they flood it with chlorine. Chlorine is not good for your fish. So I would normally wait a couple of days after a heavy water change then go back to doing your normal water changes. And again, there's water, there's water, uh, water conditioners, um, stress coat. Uh, stress coat, I like stress coat. I use stress coat in all my bags if I'm transporting fish. Like I, I, I donated a, a few bags of fish here. I like, I like using stress coats because the aloe, uh, aloe vera you know, seems to calm the fish down. Whether it acts as a drug or whatever, I'm not sure, but it tends to calm the fish so it's easy and don't thrash around the bag as much. Um, the water conditioner, of course, uh, removes the chlorine, coppers, now chloramines, uh, aquatic plus, Amquel, 
Okay, so these are all these are all positive things to use in your when you do your water treatments. Okay, um, what about pH in the water? Obviously, different species of fish live in different environments. Um, some live in a, uh, in acid type water, such as wild killies, discus like it on the acid side. Uh, it goes from anywhere from 4.5 to 6.9, such as um, sparkling garamis or uh, any of those miniature garami species, chocolate garamis, et cetera, like it a little more on the acid side. Neutral fish would be for your, uh, your bobs, your tetras, uh, mostly South American, Central American fish would like that. Uh, your alkalinity uh, fish would be African cichlids, goldfish, things of that nature. Um, so different, different uh, environments require different water conditions. Um, one of the things you do is water test sets. Uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. This is like I think everything in the world. Your, your, your pH, your, your, uh, your, your carbon hardness, your general hardness. Whoops. Whoops. Sorry, wrong button. Let's go back again. Here we go. This is for your carbonated hardness, your general hardness. I don't know. I never found the difference in it. I think it's all the same thing. We have your nitrates. Check your nitrates your carbon dioxide, your ammonia levels, okay, and, and your pH levels both for fresh or salt water. So test kits like this have basically everything, everything you ever want to look for, and they use the, the color-coded method. Of course, if you're colorblind, you got a problem. But other than that, it seems to, it seems to work pretty well. Okay, here's another one, it's Wardley's, uh, the pH test kit gives you an idea about what water ranges that you would like. This particular test kit range goes from 6.2 rather to 7.4. Okay, but it'll tell. If it gets more uh, on the yellow side, it drops into more like a 5.5 or so. And if it gets bluer than blue, if it starts going into purple, then you know you're more on the alkaline side. Okay, okay water hardness. Water hardness is the measure of calcium magnesium ion concentration in dissolved water. So here's your soft water. I think we talked about this before. You want to do eggs, okay? Um, quarry eggs or, or any other kind of fish eggs. It's got to be in the, in, the, uh, in the arena of what the fish live in in a natural environment. If you change their environment, the fish may live. They may even spawn. But that doesn't mean the, the eggs will hatch. And if they do hatch, they may not be able to survive in it, okay? So very soft water is 0 to 3 degrees. That's for your cardinal tetras, your discus, arowanas, and et cetera. Your soft water, from three to six degrees hardness, okay, is, a, is good for angelfish, your new world cichlids, your tetras, batillas, live plants. Uh, hard water, uh, six to 11, is ideal for your sawtails, guppies, and mollies. And of course, very hard water, 11 to 22, which is you know, basically brick and concrete, is ideal for your African cichlids. Goldfish like it very hard. And uh, if it gets really to the extreme, it's more of a brackish water type environment. If you add a lot of salt in water, hardness doesn't necessarily mean salinity. Okay. Okay. This is what I did with sev several of my tanks at the time. I was comparing the pH with GH. Somebody once told me, if you've got uh, a low pH, it means you have soft water. That's not that's not necessarily true. Um, Here's a 180 gallon tank that I took on, on uh, February 8th, and the pH was 6.8, which was on the, slightly on the acid side, but the general hardness was 12. Okay, here's a 175 gallon tank that I had synodontis in, it's the pH was 6.0, okay, and the general hardness was 5, which of course was not ideal for that species of fish. Okay? My 40 gallon on the same date was 7.2, but the hardness was 5, 6.95, 7.3. Okay? Then I went back and I checked the same tanks in November, and you got the same, it's a 7.2 pH with a general hardness of 6. Okay? 7.6 with a general hardness of 4. Okay? So this could have went up some. So it gives you, a, it gives you an idea of where, of where you are, but all this is is just to give you an idea that uh, don't take it for granted that if the, if the water is acidic, 
that it's soft or if the water is alkaline, it's hard. Of course, it may not be. You really need to check them both, depending on the species of fish you have. Okay? Um, here's things to make the water soft. Okay? You have your, the water softening pillows. You have your peat moss bags. Uh, Riddick actually is uh, also, it, even though it, it controls egg and stuff like that, it also uh, reduces the, uh, the pH in the water, as does like black water extract, makes the water soft and on the acidic side. Okay. Uh, this is for, you could have like water conditioners, like waters of the world. You can use like buffers. Uh, of course, your baking soda is a natural brings, and I always use this for bringing the pH up in a tank. Um, if you want to raise it and you just add a little bit of baking soda, it'll bring it up a few degrees. I like to use Epsom salts. Like when, every time I do a water change, it's where I check the water about, about once a month or so, once every month and a half or so, I add some Epsom salts to it. It has different minerals in it that uh, other salts don't have. It's, I, I think, for me it works, I don't know. So, and kosher salt, of course, is the aspirin, is the aspirin for fish. You know, I just use kosher salt for everything. It's good in your food. Hey, if it's good in your food, it's gotta be good for your fish, right? So how you look at it. Oops, sorry. Okay, different kinds of gravel. Okay, there's sand gravel, there's gravel with color, there's glass, dol well, dolomite in the good old days. Uh, crushed coral, which is pretty much in the good old days as well. Peat, you got leaves and plant matter on the bottom. And of course you have the bare glass bottom, okay? Uh, those are different types of, of gravel environment. Okay, this is one of my larger tanks with a uh, basic gravel. Uh, with some flower pots holding up a flat rock so the, the fish can use that as shelter. A uh, piece of wood, uh, you see the uh, part of an eheim here, uh, eheim filter. It gives you an idea about the gravel. Right? That's dolomite, which I used to use for the African cichlids because it, it keeps the pH and the hardness up. Okay, this is, uh, that, just, just to let you know, that's a perfectly uh, taken picture is that your eyes are a little off center. So I don't think, you know, don't think there's anything wrong with the picture because I know that's, that's perfect. Uh, this is Sahara sand. Uh, this is another African cichlid type of mix that keeps the, the pH up and it keeps the, um, the alkalinity up uh, as well. Okay. Types of filtration. You got your sponge filters, your box filters, your overflow, your under gravel, your canister filters, and of course the wet dry filters for those of you who are using uh, sumps. Okay, okay, here's some of the, uh, the sponge filters that I use. These are, uh, these are different types of, um, what is it, AquaClears use these, the sponges in them. Well, I, I can hollow them out and that can go into uh, into a, uh, an overflow filter at the bottom of an overflow filter if you have baby fish in there. Okay, the baby fish don't get sucked up into the, into the intake tube. Okay, so I use things like that. This is the bottom of a pizza box, you know, and they deliver the pizza. It keeps it, the pizza from hitting the box, okay? Uh, this particular type of sponge filter, this fit under that exactly. So a little silicon glue keeps it in place and uh, the babies can go in underneath that without getting squashed. Regular, regular type of sponge filter. And this is a box filter. What I'm using on the top is if you're using baby fish, I use a, uh, an air conditioning filter. I cut it down uh, so it would fit that. And I put a couple of rubber bands, usually two, two this way and then two this way so the, the baby, the fry can't get inside it. Because once they get in, they, they won't be able to get out. So that kind of keeps the fry, if you're gonna use that type of filtration system, uh, it keeps the babies uh, you know, alive. Okay, and this is, this is one of the things. You could also use, again, uh, you know, if, you're, if your spouse has, a, uh, has a, a pet or whatever they use them for, you can cut a piece of that off and wrap it around it. That works as well, as well as the, as the, uh, the sponges, the sponge type filters. Uh, that, I, that was in the last picture. 
So these overflow, these overflows are great because when an overflow, you don't need like uh, uh, aeration, okay? Because it cr it produces its own, so you can save like one uh, one uh, electrical outlet and still aerate the tank. Okay, these are some of your canister filters uh, that they have, overflow filters. This is Eheim's. These are all Eheim types. Okay, these are aquarium decorations. Of course, you use plants, gravel, wood, rocks, various types of, uh, of ornaments, okay? Uh, be it in plastic, ceramic, or clay, ornaments, and of course, lighting. All right, here's all of them combined into one, into one fish tank. Okay, you've got your, uh, this is my mother-in-law right there. She's doing quite well. She lives on, she lives on with us forever, which is a wonderful thing. Ceramic cave, okay. Um, piece of wood on rock, which I turned over and you could use it that way. This is a tank divider. Um, I have put some silicon glue on and threw some light gravel on it. So it's, it's semi, um, the fish can't exactly see through the other side. It was better when I first did it, but as time goes on, it kind of erodes. Okay, and different kinds of caves. You don't have to stand them up, you can put them sideways. The fish, fish don't care. They're very agreeable. And of course, some live plants, java ferns or what have you, okay? Just gives you an idea about different things that you can use in your tank that uh, if it's not perfectly fit, we'll try to hold up some type of a, uh, of a tank divider so you can use different species of, of fish within a tank. Um, here's a couple of slate pieces glued together over a, over a large pot. Is a, of course a, a discus breeding cone, Some wood pieces, another couple of caves. A PVC tubing is great for uh, especially whiptail cats. They love to spawn in, in, uh, in PVC, small PVC tubes. Um, they all seem to work out quite well for me anyway. And again, the tank divider, as you can see. So. Flat rocks, the spawn on. As you can tell, I'm more at the spawning than I am at anything else. So I like breeding fish. What are levels for spawning? Different levels for different species. Okay. Uh, where do certain species of fish spawn within the vertical limits of an aquarium? What is the optimal water level in the aquarium to have certain species of fish breed successfully? Top of the water level, we have Achilles. In plant leaves and floating plants, minnows within the plants from the surface to the bottom, catfish species that build bubble nests, uh, pike minnows, gars, and anabanthoids, bettas, garamis, things of that nature. They all need some type of plant to help them, such as bettas and garamis. They use bits of plant to keep the bubble nest together when they put their fry in. Uh, that's important for them. Mid levels, you have your herring type African cichlids. Your lower levels, your danios, your tetras, your goldfish and barbs. Also, piranhas and pacus, because uh, I haven't bred them yet, but one of, one of the things you want to work on, maybe. Uh, of course, on your bottom species, your cichlid, your loaches, and, and various types of, of, of other types of catfish, such as Corydoras. Not all of them, but the majority of them. Uh, the oddballs, angel fishels on an object at a 45 degree angle, mid to the upper levels of the, of the water. Whiptail and other Corydoras catfish on the aquarium glass. Okay. So different species do it in different ways. So just because it's, it's in the cichlid category or a Corydoras catfish doesn't mean that they all spawn the same way. Like I was, I was mentioning earlier before, I've got Corydoras matei and I've got Corydoras um, uh, orange lasers. Okay. The mateis spawn on the artificial mops that I have in the bottom of the tank, whereas the orange lasers spawn at the top of the glass uh, where the water level is. So they'll go all the way up the top and they'll lay their eggs there. So even though both Corridoras and both living in the same tank, they spawn in com completely different ways. So. Food for spawning conditions. Okay, here you've got your various types of pellet food, um, flake food, uh, Cichlid staples, etc. These are all uh, quality foods that your fish would enjoy. Okay, zucchini. And you're breeding uh, ancestrous catfish. This is this is what you want to do. 
I usually go to the Chinese market because for some reason Chinese markets always have zucchini at greatly reduced prices. So I get a few from the lower end, the damaged ones, whatever. I bring them home, I cut them up, slice them up into things, and I freeze them. And then when I, I take a small flat rock, put them on a rubber band, drop it in the tank, and the zucchini and the, uh, and the uh, ancestors love it. Not only them, but certain types of cichlids and other fish, especially Africans. Okay, okay then you get your frozen foods. A curry, the blood worms. A curry has, and I think they all do. I think they all come with vitamins and other supplements now as well. But your daphnia and, and other types of frozen food that you can feed your fish. Okay, then if you want to start buying them in bulk, uh, places like um, uh, Gemco will sell you uh, kilos of food. So it's 2.2 pounds, uh, and you can get like soft and moist. There's others, Ken's Fish, and there's a lot of others that sell, you know, large bags that either be at flakes or pellets or, or uh, whatever in, in larger quantities. So depending on how many fish, you have lots of fish, I'm sure you can get it at a greatly reduced price. Or sometimes maybe you want to you wanna pool your resources as club and say, uh, you know, we're going to get like five pounds or ten pounds of food. Uh, we used to do that in Brooklyn. We used to get uh, Purina trout chow. We used to buy a 40-pound bag because I mean, we had a lot of cichlid people then. And we used to divvy up this 40-pound bag between maybe, you know, 20 members or whatever the case may be. We'll chip in. And why not, why not, to, be, uh, why not to be a very good resource? So there's, uh, there's ways you can do that. And as a club, you have greater buying power. I know Raleigh, the Raleigh uh, club does that. I see Larry Jinks down there. He puts something out all the time, and they're going either for frozen food or, or, or regular you know, pellet food or whatever. And his members will chip in, and, and they get the food. I think it's a great idea. And of course, food for me, as the water changer and fish feeder, of course, is this is what I like to sit back and relax with as I, as I watch my fish have a good time. And is later on in the evening, after the nighttime water changes, I have a little. I add a little ice to it, so I mix it a little, a little bit of ice to help uh, help cool things off a little bit. All right, now fruit for fry growth. Here's your zucchini. So how I bag them up, put them in the freezer. Okay. Here's your uh, your brine shrimp net, a hatch brine shrimp, and. Uh, Put into that, and uh, you know that goes into uh, usually a wonton, a, a pint-sized wonton thing, and then I use a turkey baster, or I'll use a pipette, and I'll feed the various baby fish with that, and it seems to go out pretty well. Again, your your frozen uh, your frozen foods, they come in different sizes. Of course, you don't need to buy a one-pound flat; you can buy some of the smaller sizes as well, but uh, they're all pretty good. And you always got to check on online to see, you know, who has the better deals for you, of course. So, like, um, as an example, San Francisco brand may have uh, a 36-portion a uh, um, uh, as opposed to maybe Hakari's got a 20-portion for the same price. So maybe you want to look at that if you're buying, like, your brine shrimp or rotifers or, or blood worms or now they've got mini blood worms and and things of that nature. So you want to, you want to check it around and see which, which, the best price that you can get. Okay. okay. The other thing I like to do is go back, and I like to check the ingredients on that. I mean, you do that, especially women do that when they do shopping. Uh, you go and you check out uh, what kind of food, what's in it, what are the ingredients that make, make up the food that you're serving to your family. Well, why would it be any difference uh, serving the food to your fish? You would try to get them the most protein, the most, uh, you know, the most protein and the most fat. To me, the most, two most important things are your protein and your fat fiber, okay? The other stuff, crude fiber, moisture, and air, so filler. They either they hold it together or they give it bulk or they make it float or not float or whatever. And then you go and you see what the formula is, you know? You know, this is whole salmon, halibut, black cod, herring. This is great. You got uh, clams, oscopus, squid, wheat flour, okay. Uh, you got vitamins, okay. These are all beneficial ingredients, be it for your fish or be it for your family, right? And then you have another type where your protein, your fat 
content are almost the same as, as the previous slide, okay? And then you can still have your, you know, a little bit more of the ingredients for your ash, your moisture, and your, and your fiber. So you got a little bit more on the percentages on that. But if you look at the ingredients, you got fish meal, fish oil, blood meal, feather meal, brewer's yeast, soy, and I lose track on about how to say these things. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know, you got some B12, it's not B12, but it's a B12 supplement. And this is a source of vitamin D3. Um, so it makes you, makes you question the quality of the food that you give into your, your fish. And I think that's something that, as, you know, as a hobbyist, we should, we should know, or try to learn anyway. Okay, okay. Uh, more fun things for baby fish. Here's your fry bites, you got Cyclopes, if you could even find that stuff anymore. It's very rare to get now. Okay, your micro worms, okay, your baby brine shrimp here. Your little fry formula for uh, inf infusoria, okay, and your decapsulated brine shrimp. You know, I never found any fish that liked decapsulated brine shrimp uh, on my own. It just didn't work, but some people find it very successful. Again, different strokes for different folks, right? Okay, spawning helpers. Okay, so here you got for your, uh, your Corydoras and other types of catfish. They like, I use 35 millimeter film canisters, and you could either float them or you can fill them up with gravel and let them go to the bottom. And there's your artificial mop, okay? And they spawn on the yarn. And you have your caves, your cichlids. Some fish like to spawn on the side of, uh, of either wood or a plastic, whatever, okay? Um, again, different environments. You have your PVC tubing, you have, uh, you know, cichlids like this spawn on types of uh, broken flower pots. Nothing goes to waste in a fish tank, you know, nothing. Everything is useful, one way or another. And I use a half of a styrofoam cup for uh, garamis and uh, paradise fish. They like to build a bubble nest underneath that. Okay, this is a, a, uh, a Tadia, uh, who, who this was a, an old time uh, wedding, wedding favor that was handed out. And I said, instead of just leaving, gathering dust on a shelf, why not put it to use in my fish tank? And yeah, hey, at least you see somebody, somebody enjoys using it. Well, again, nothing goes to waste, right? Hatcheries, hatcheries are devices used to hatch the eggs or as a location that live bearers can deposit the baby safely. This keeps the baby safe from mom, dad, and others in the aquarium. It enables the fry to get a good starting chance in life. Okay? Uh, some of the old-time hatcheries for live bearers, oldies but goodies, okay? This is, a, this is a Tom Miglio special. Tom was a sergeant at arms at Brooklyn for many years, and, and he helped me a lot when it comes to spawning spawning fish and doing show fish and things of that nature. And this was something he, he made up. He used uh, a, a plastic uh, divider and then he put some, some very fine meshing and he was able to, to silicone glue it to the, to the larger mesh and position it in such a way that it, it took this 15 gallon tank or 20 long and it, it positioned it in a way that you could still close the covers on it and you can put three different types of fish in there. The types of fish that we were using at the time were African cichlids that were mouth brooders. So we put the mom in there, and she would then feel comfortable enough to release a fry. And I, we'd like to leave, if possible, leave, leave the babies with the mother for 10 days. This way she would imprint the, uh, the qualities of motherhood, basically don't eat the babies, <laughs> don't kill them when they come out, things like that. Uh, and they would, so when, when those fish grow up and they start laying eggs, they, they would in turn hopefully become good parents if given the same conditions. Okay? This is a Joe Ferdenzi special from Greater City. A lot of you still remember Joe. He's still active in the club. This is for just if you just got a few eggs came out, I use some smaller bottles. Um, this is the air pump, uh, airline tubing holders, okay? 
some valve, uh, air valve regulators, air stones. There's another type, but a uh, uh, hole in this is for uh, hatching brine shrimp. Okay, I use it in uh, a liter bottle. Seems to work out pretty well. Okay, here's my, here's my contraption. I think this is like, what is it, meta, like an old Metaframe five gallon tank? Uh, five high, I think they used to call it. You don't find these around anymore. This is a, uh, a Coca-Cola soda thing for the liter bottles. I cut it in half and it fit in perfectly, okay? Um, it could take uh, three uh, liter bottles and it could take a couple of the smaller bottles. Um, this is my crazy contraption, the air valve, uh, the, the valve controller, double air pump, and uh, I keep it off the ground using uh, basically sponge filter bottoms, the weighted sponge filter bottoms to hold it there and different kinds of, uh, you know, air valve, uh, air controllers. Okay, I use the, um, I use a heater, and in the heater I wrap it with airline tubing. And I wrap it with airline tubing because a lot of times the babies would get out and go in the bottom, and if they touch the heating coil, poof, they're gone, okay? But with the airline tubing on it, okay, they don't get burned. They're able to stay away from it. Okay, here's a closer look at that. Gives you a better idea about how the bottom looks to keep it off the ground so it's not flat. Okay, and this is what I put on the inside of each, of each bottle. It's a airline tubing followed by a, a straight plastic tube. And then at the bottom of that tube, I use a small, what is it, quarter of an inch, half of an inch a type of regular, regular airline tubing again with an air stone. Okay, this gives the flexibility for that air stone to go in and be able to bend at the bottom. So you know it doesn't go in and, and crush anything on the bottom. It little, gives you a little bit more flexibility. Okay, sexing fish. Trying to identify males from females. Many times it's not as easy as you would think. The fish know who they are. We don't, a lot of times. Okay. Um, this could be easier, could be very difficult, depending on the size and type of fish. Majority of cases, the males are the most colorful and feel more vibrant than the female. Size is a factor because many females are larger and more robust in the midsection than males. Notice I didn't say fat, I just said robust, okay? Anal and dorsal fins are more pointed in the male and more rounded in females. Genitalia on some fish are visible on males and appear as a belly button on females. Some fish cannot be sexed until they are probed and with some species, even then there is no guarantee. This is why people start with a group of six to eight young fish and let the fish choose their mates. A group of this size will allow for accidents and premature deaths and still have the odds in their favor that a pair will be present. Can fish change their sex? Yes, some fish can. I've had it with some South American fish uh, cichlids uh, and I've, I've, I've known other people saying the same thing, that they had a group of of all, all females or whatever. Now, that's not the same as to say where there's a dominant male and then there's lesser males. Lesser males basically uh, disguise themselves as females so as not to incur the wrath of the dominant male. This is different. This is when these fish have already been spawning and then one, the male will die for whatever reason and then another female even though I know that fish to be small, sometimes you only have two or maybe possibly three females, so you know your fish, that fish will then change sex and start spawning another one. It's, it's possible, and other people have said that as well. So I found that to be quite amazing. I had, uh, I got some fish from Dr. Loisel, some uh, Lake Cara uh, Cameroon cichlids, and there was one that I saw was a pair. Male definitely colored up, black throat, dark green body, the female was lighter in color, larger. I put them together, and uh, the first time, the female was holding eggs, and uh, after a couple of days, she either spit them or ate them, which is okay, if the young fish, that happens, they're not, they're not uh, fertile, or maybe they're uh, 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 immature fish. Uh, the second spawn, same thing. The third spawn, 
which was odd because both fish spawned. Both fish were holding eggs. And I said, that's weird, because even in biparental mouth brooders, like we see, I think there's a type of, of, uh, of severum that does that. They'll actually move fish from one, one fish to the other. But I've never seen or heard of a fish that both fish have spawned and both fish are holding eggs. Okay? It turns out that it was two females, the females disguised as a male that was spawning with the other female. Naturally, none of the eggs were, were fertile, but it gave me pause to think. I said, wow, I got you know, fish that, w which I thought was a male, is really not a male. But, so it's, 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 it's still a, a, a still baffling uh, subject many times. All right, apple snails as an example. Here's one apple snail laying eggs. Apple snails don't need uh, another snail. Okay, they can, they could be male, female, whatever, and lay, lay eggs their own. It's not a problem. Uh, your blue pearl shrimp, okay, they have a gestation period of, I think it's 28 to 30 days. Um, neo, the neocaridina species, which is more of a, of a hard water species as some of the other types that have the white markings on them, they're more of an acidic sand kind of shrimp, okay? Gives you an idea, okay? These are uh, Batis corrigeus. Here's the male all colored up. Here's a female plump with eggs. And they go into these, uh, these caves and they were spawning in there. Okay. But obviously easy to identify. The male is brightly colored. The female also changes color, but changes more of a darker hue. Okay. Okay. These are uh, better uh, alba marginatas. Here's the female. There's the male. This is the uh, better channoids, okay? The male and the females. And this is the spawning embrace when they're laying eggs, okay? And the male holds the eggs. Okay, better macrostoma. This is a pair of better macrostomas. The male, the male gets more, it's more vibrant in his coloration. The female developed this green backing, and green on her gills, gill plate much more coloration than normal. Normally she's just a, a dull, bland, like a brown color, okay? Um, okay, this is, again, the female and the male. And this is getting ready to go into the embrace. And this is done in a 10 wide. They spawned in a 10 wide for me. Okay, they're going into the embrace, starting it, and getting it to the wrap around here. Squeeze the egg. And the male would hold the eggs as long as he can. But sometimes the female tends to harass him. You need a lot of hiding places for them because the female gets very uh, aggressive uh, at that point. And this is the male collects the eggs, the female uh, collects the sperm, and then she'll shoot the eggs. She passes the eggs into the male's mouth and the male holds him, hails the eggs in his buccal cavity. Very interesting fish. Paradise fish. Again, this is a, a uh, styrofoam cup. And this is the male. Okay, the female is still, you can still, she's still holding eggs in her. She's still pretty wide. He'll squeeze the eggs out and, and place them up into the nest. Okay. These are white cloud minnows, mountain minnows. Um, the female has got the largest stomach area. The male is much more colorful. He gets what they call a, a, a pigeon breast look. The male, if, I don't know if any of you raised pigeons or, or flew pigeons, but uh, the male, uh, male pigeon, when he struts around and he puts his, pops his chest out when he's looking to spawn with a, with a female. So they call that a, a pigeon breast look. And, they tend to have that look when they're, when they're ready to spawn, okay? This is the uh, sparkle white cloud uh, minnow. This is from, this is a Vietnamese uh, white cloud. Slightly, this is the mycogemma species at Al Albanubis. Different species of white clouds. Okay, and there's live bearers. Obviously, that's the female. The male is much more colorful. Okay, this is uh, 
My, this is an upside down catfish from India. Uh, can you tell if it's a male or a female? It's a male. Okay, the female has a type of like belly button underneath. Larger fish, you can see that. That's a, uh, this is a pajama catfish, I think. You can't see the whole thing, so I'm just a guess at my part right now. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Sinodontus multipunctatus, the cuckoo catfish. Very interesting catfish. He, he spawns with uh, African cichlids, mouth-rooting cichlids, in that he'll strip away, he'll take their eggs away and deposit his own eggs in their place, gesundheit. And uh, this one is a male, as you can tell, okay? And underneath it is a, a small cichlid. Okay, Synodontus angelicus. The uh, males, at least in my experience with them, I've had several, the males have a darker, darker brown look to them. The females have more of a lighter brown. And as, as with most catfish, you can see they have a wider midsection. And the females a lot, usually get larger than the males do. Okay, honeycomb toddies, okay? Uh, again, the male is darker in color, okay? Other than that, they're almost identical. The female is a uh, shade lighter, and she has this wider abdomen area. That's where the eggs are held, okay? Give you an idea how to sex these. Whiptail cats, there, there's the male. Sorry, I couldn't get a better photograph than that, but he's actually sitting on uh, green eggs. And the interesting thing about this, the male guards the eggs, and uh, it's important to have the male in guarding the eggs, uh, because what he does was he actually chews off part of the egg sac that allows the fry to come out from the egg. So it's important to have the males in there with them. Okay, the female is nowhere to be seen. Once she deposits the egg, she takes off, and the male is left to guard the nest. And uh, I've only had them spawn in open-ended, open-ended tubes. Uh, I tried it in closed tubes, never worked. They wouldn't spawn in it. Okay. Hoplosternum littorals. Okay. The, you can tell the male because he has this, what we call a ski uh, fin. It goes up on a 45 degree angle. That's the males there. I had them spawn in a 30-gallon tank. A very interesting. They, uh, they took all the plants in the tank. And, uh, well, before they did that, let me go back. They're trying to get them to spawn. And uh, a couple of people came over and tried to give me some advice about how to get them to spawn and whatnot. And uh, they said, oh, put a lot of plants in the tank. Okay. Put a lot of java moss and java fern and uh, all the other floating loose plants kind of thing. So come down one morning and I found the entire top of the 30 gallon tank covered about an inch of eggs, bubbles. Just an inch of bubbles across the entire tank from front to back. The, the um, overflow filter was going just at a, basically at a drip. Okay, it, was all, it was all filled up. Um, and I'm waiting for them. I said, all right, they gotta have, they gotta be moving the eggs, they're gonna be doing this, gonna do that. There, was, there wasn't one egg in that whole bubble nest. Not one. They built decoy nests for birds and for animals, raccoons, or whatever the case may be. There wasn't anything. And then about maybe several weeks later, they took all of the plant matter and they bundled it up into a ball in the middle of the tank. And at the time, I had, I had reintroduced a couple of big chocolate cichlids into the tank. And they, would, they were beating the heck out of these chocolate cichlids. So I said, well, something's up. Something's happening. I said, let me, let me get these chocolate cichlids out of there. I pulled them out. I waited about a week. And all of a sudden, I start seeing these little, little hop to them fry coming out from these, from these uh, plants. They laid their eggs in the plant matter. 
and all that big, all that bubbles and all the other things that they did meant nothing. It was amazing. They, you know, it's, they, they never stopped teaching us things, you know? You gotta do is learn, uh, you know, pay attention to them. Spectacular fish. Okay, angelfish. This was a blue angel, uh, laid eggs. Angelfish are weird, as, as most people know. Most cichlids could be a pain when you want them to spawn and they never do. Because they spawn when they want to spawn, not when we want them to spawn. Okay? So after I got the blue angels to start spawning, they were spawning like crazy. Like every 12 days, they'd be laying eggs. I said, look, I don't have any more room for these eggs. I'm going to stop. I'm taking all of the, I'm taking all of anything that's on an angle, I'm getting it out of there. Wood pieces, the heater, you know, anything they could lay eggs on, I'm getting it out of there. So what did they do? I, I, I took the rocks, I put them egg flat on the ground, they started laying their eggs on the flat rock. And they were valid, they were valid eggs. I was getting fry out of them. I says, nature has a way, right? Now we don't want them to stop. It's like too much, but they don't care. He says, nope, we gotta keep going. Interesting. Okay, here's the chocolate cichlids. Male's got the hump on its head. The female, as you can see, is much smaller, okay? but. These much larger fish. These were the fish that the hoplosternum littorales were, were, just, were just pounding. They were just pounding them until I had to get them out. It was like they were just they were running for their lives, literally. Okay, Cryptohero species, Sajikas, with some fry. Finally got a decent picture of that, right? Came out pretty good. Okay, uh, Herichthys, uh, de pi, de pi, I can't say that, de pi, de pi, de pi, de pi, de pi, de pi, de boop, wood fry, okay. Checkerboard cichlid, mom with babies, Dicrosis filamentosus. There's the babies on the bottom. Good old mom, very colorful fish, very nice. Okay, uh, Achilles. Um, Northobranchus Rakovi, Kulamane, male. This was their, uh, again, I like my, uh, my wonton soup containers. I cut a hole in the top. They dive into the peat, lay their eggs. And uh, this is a, a Forshai male. It's male here, male there. The female is probably still in there laying eggs. Oh, I know. But uh, very colorful fish, nice, nice killies. Okay, um, the uh, Norman's lamp eye, okay? This is uh, an oddball kind of uh, killie. Uh, very interesting, blue eye, they call them the blue eyes. Um, I guess my question is, are they considered, I guess they are considered killies as opposed to some of the, the smaller Australian rainbow fish. So these would be killies, right? I think so. Okay. Um, these are the uh, Orizaeus mekongensis, the um, Mekong River, these redfin lamp eyes. Okay. And they lay their eggs in the mops. They should have another picture. This could be a better idea. Yep, there we go. Okay, this is a uh, or Isaias wawares, the daisies rice fish, and these are the mops that they lay their eggs in. Obviously, this is a female, a female. Okay, the males have much more color, not as big as the females are. Give me an idea. Okay, the Shredders catastinati, a type of buffalo head. Okay. Uh, Cryptohera, Cryptochromis, Leptosoma, Kagoma. These are the ones of these midwater spawners. Okay, they like to spawn in midwater. Um, there's the, with the blue tail, there's the yellow version and the blue version. I've had females breed with both at the same time. So they'd be swapping with, uh, you would think there'd be one and then she'll go over to a uh, yellow headed male and, and Go with eggs on that, so they do what they want to do. Whatever floats their boat. Okay, Paracryptochromis nigropinus. They spawn on the 
um, side of a flower pot. Okay, here's one, he's a female with the, the fry, the eggs have already hatched and she's holding the fry in her mouth. Okay, okay Pseudotrophius osses. Uh, again, you see that broken flower pot? There's an egg over here. Um, she's, holding, she's holding eggs in her mouth now. Uh, when this male was done spawning, another male snuck in and spawned with her as well. <laughs> so you never know. Don't step away for a second. They'll get behind you. Okay? Stripping fish. This is something you would do with like African cichlids as an example. Okay, you, you pry the fish from the mother's mouth. Um, there's a lot of reasons for doing that. Sometimes uh, the female, if she's in an environment, there's a lot of other fish there, uh, she won't release the eggs. She won't leave her fry. She won't release the fry because as soon as she releases them, the other fish in the tank can eat them. So she'll hold them. And she may hold them and, and actually eat them or hold them until they starve to death. You know, the babies in her mouth may, may die because she just won't release them. So... You know, and then you're not, they will go for 28 days and, or 30 days before they would release the fish, and they're pretty weak at the point of that. They have to you know, take her out and let her get her strength back, usually five to 10 days to get her strength back afterwards. Yeah. So here's the Aussie we saw before that was spawning. Okay, she's got a lot of uh, eggs or fry in her mouth. And this, uh, you can see, um, this Niagara Pinnis female has got a mouthful of fry in there as well. Okay. This is a yellow lab. I'm going to take a close-up. You see the babies in, holding her mouth. Yellow labs are weird. I mean, I don't know if you've experienced this, but every yellow lab I've had, and I've bred several of them, they'll hold the babies, they'll hold the eggs in their mouth till term, 30 days, and as soon as they release them, they try to eat them right away. Don't know why. The only fish I had that was consistently like that. So I had to set up like one of those trap conditions where the babies can get escaped from underneath and the mother couldn't chase them. Hey, baby fish. Baby fish need a lot of space to grow, so larger in tanks, called grow out tanks, as soon as possible. For best results, you feed quality foods two to three times each day. But you perform 10% 10, 10 water changes daily if possible. It's the best way to get them on Feed them a lot and grow them up quick and just, you know, obviously water changes, water changes, water changes. Okay. Um, again, we're back to the heater with the airline tubing on it. Um, this is a, uh, a worm holder, I guess. I put a couple of styrofoam pieces with a couple of clothespins on it so it'll float on top of the water. You've just got a, maybe some, a few eggs or maybe a couple of little fry that you don't want to mix with anything else, I would put them in something like that. Okay, uh, yellow, uh, this yellow lab fry, okay? These are the eggs, okay, a beige colored eggs. And this is after they've hatched, they still got the egg, egg sac on them. So you don't feed them while they have the egg sac, wait till that to be absorbed and then they're free, they're, they're basically free swimming as opposed to hopping. Oh, the leptosoma, the kagoma fry. Baby's still on their egg sacs, as you can see. Okay, uh, Parasipricomus nigropinus. Uh, I had written an article that was printed in the, uh, the ACA Buntbosch bulletin, called it a fox in a hen house. Uh, what had happened was the mother picked up a, a uh, uh, Sinodontus multipunctatus egg. And uh, the egg, the uh, eggs are different. They're like a jade green color, and they're much smaller than a cichlid egg. They hatch in four days. Cichlid eggs hatch in eight days. Okay, so after four days, all you see is like two dots for eyes and a mouth. The rest of the body is beige. And as time goes on, it starts getting a little bit more and more coloration in it. But during that time, he's eating the eggs, he's eating the fry, he's eating whatever he can eat. And these fry are just breakfast, lunch, and dinner for this guy. I, what I used to do for the, uh, for the multipunctatus fry, if I didn't have them with uh, hold, you know, if I, was, if I took them out and I put them into the tank, I would take uh, South American cichlid eggs, 
I would uh, siphon them up and, and freeze them. And then I would put them in a batch of like maybe 10 to 20 eggs at a time. And then if I had the, the, uh, the catfish, I would, I would drop the frozen eggs in there and they would hatch it a few times. And these guys were so small, they would literally nudge the egg into the corner of the tank, go up on their head over the egg and force themselves down onto the egg. It was amazing. The egg w was bigger than their head and they would eventually take the whole egg in anyway. Absolutely amazing fish. So I, there was a nice, that was a nice article about that. Um, okay, here's the two types of hoplostunums I bred. These, these fish spawned the same day. The, uh, the uh, thoracatum, you can tell the, this is the thoracatum, a little smaller than the, uh, the littoral. The thoracatum, the males have an orange uh, pectoral fin. Okay, and the males, of course, in this species, develop that ski slope, 45 degree angle thing. This was done, I don't know, maybe two months later. You could see how much larger the, the littoral is over the thoracatum. Just a much bigger fish. They, these, these spawn, they lay orange eggs, and they lay it underneath the top of a, the plastic top of a coffee can. So you get the coffee can, you take the plastic top off, put it on top, and they'll go underneath it and they'll lay their eggs. You go to put your hand in there, they will attack you. They're very protective of their eggs. Okay, this is the, um, the uh, whoops, sorry. Get back, get back, get back, get back, get back. There you go. Go up. Okay, there we are. Okay, this, the uh, Pseudotrophy is Asi. Uh, these are the fry. She had in her mouth, there was 188 fry in her mouth. Hard to believe that she fit all those babies in there. But they're all out, they're doing well. Okay, honeycomb, honeycomb tadia eggs in a cushion. Okay, use the micro lens to, to take this picture and even though it's not obviously the greatest, you can see the embryo and then there's like, when they lay the eggs out, the eggs come out and then they develop this, they absorb this water cushion around the embryo. And then the fish, after uh, a week, will break out of that and start to develop as baby catfish. And these here, we had these in about, I think these were like three weeks old. These were baby honey, honeycomb tadias in a plastic teaspoon. And they're just like the exact replicas of mom and dad, but how much, obviously much smaller. Okay, these are, oh, um, these are the uh, Corydoras barbatus fry. These are the eggs just hatched. I hatched them in a, in a Petri dish. There's an egg that didn't hatch yet, okay? Corydoras fry. There's one over here. Another, I think there's an egg over there. Uh, use some um, crushed coral. But I have to keep the water a little hard for them, okay? Just give you an idea. Okay, uh, these are Nick Waragwentz with their fry. Ram babies, albino ancestors, long fins, them. This was the, uh, just to let you know, I keep, in order to keep the water hard for them at a higher pH, this is some of that Sahara sand, that African sand that works very well. Works very well with quarries too, by the way. So my quarries like that as well. Keeps the pH up. Okay, white cloud minnow fry. You can see some of them here. Transporting fish, taking fish from their home aquarium and moving them to another location. All right, jungle used to make the bag buddy. I don't know if they still do anymore, but uh, I never used this with baby fish. Baby fish had to eat the blue, what's called center, and die. So have bigger fish when you put this, like obviously cichlids, whatever. Uh, one third, whoops, gotta get used to this. One third water, two thirds air. And that's Jason from Greater City. Hi, Jason. As you can see, he's Greater great City there. Buckets. You could also transport fish in buckets. When I was into showing fish, um, one of the things we used to do is, is obviously put them in buckets, but if you got a show fish, I would suggest you line it with a plastic bag. 
that goes in the inside of the bag. The reason why you do that is sometimes, even though you feel it's perfectly smooth in there, it's usually not. There's usually nicks in that where if a fish is thrashing around or if it's rolling around, you might catch, might catch an eye, might get scratched, something like that. Or may, you may lose a couple of, of, um, of uh, not fins, but um, scales. scales. Scales, thank you. And if you do that and you put them in the show, say, hey, he was perfect when he left, but now he's, he's got some nicks on him. And you're going to lose because of that. So anytime you're going to transport your fish, you're going to put them in that. Um, a lot of people put holes in it, so you can put a, a portable aerator with you, put an air stone. Okay, just drill a hole in the, in the top. And, and do it that way. But always, always put a, a plastic bag. I like using black plastic bags. So it doesn't, I guess it doesn't really matter in that anyway, but you know, it just makes it easier. Sometimes when you see like a discus or, or angelfish being transported from, a, from a, 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 a store, a fish store, they'll put, it, they'll put the bottom of it in a, a black, uh, black plastic so that the fish, can't, and the fish don't get nervous. Yeah? Okay, rules and habits. Because of breeding fish and raising fry. So what you need is adequate aquarium tank size. You need a good heater, a good thermometer, a good filtration, and good food. Okay, a regular cycle of water changes. Make it a habit and the same percentage amount each time. Always use a tap water conditioner and try to keep the same tap water temperature as the tank water, with, of course, some exceptions. Use of aged water or rain water only under certain conditions for certain types of, of, of fish species. Never overcrowd your tanks. Fry uh, require grow out tanks. Thank you. And the PowerPoint presenter was layout and design was my friend Steve Hahn. Remove the odor of fish or fish room from your fish room. Take a pint plastic container and fill it halfway up with de-ice crystals. The salt you spread it around to remove the frozen ice from the sidewalk. Okay? If your family will appreciate it and in return maybe look away when you try to add another aquarium tank. So it, it, it acts like uh, baking soda in your refrigerator. So you'll put it in there, it actually takes the humidity out of the, out of the air and makes the room smell fresher. So something to think about, okay? Thank you.